continuously. What I'm trying to show you from uh, this image and the next few quotations is that Dante's, uh, Dante's structure is hell being the reverse image of purgatory and paradise. So if Dante uses hymns and psalms with a um, purifying function, with a, an uplifting and morally, spiritually edifying uh, function in purgatory, in hell, we have a perverse, uh, a sort of degraded music that reminds the eternally damned that they can never, ever get there to purgatory or paradise. And for example, here also in Canto 3, a few lines down, we continue reading, we continue reading and we continue hearing in Dante's lines some of the horrifying screams. Quivi sospiri e pianti e alti guai risonavan per l'aere senza stelle, per chi io al cominciarne lagrimai. Diverse lingue, orribili favelle, parole di dolore, accenti d'ira, voci alte e fioche, suon di manconelle, facevano un tumulto il qual s'aggira sempre in quell'aura senza tempo, tinta come l'arena quando turbo spira. Nimrod, with this loud horn, is unable to properly speak. And when he rants about Raphael, what that may mean, you know, scholars have tried to wreck their brains. Um, it could just be something that has to do with the Archangel Raphael. We don't really know what it means, but it's meaningful that, meaningful that the narrator, which is, of course, also Dante after the journey, says that no sweeter psalms were fit to his mouth. So psalms are evoked here precisely with the idea of reversing that uh, uh, spiritually purifying and morally edifying function that they do have in purgatory. There's one more song that I'd like to uh, tell you about in Inferno, in, in, in the very last canto, so canto 34 of Inferno. This is a very ancient song. It's called Vexilla Regis Prodeum. The original version of it, written by Venantius Fortunatus, Bishop of Poitiers, an important city that uh, sits on the, you know, on the, at the feet of the Pyrenees, and um, that uh, and he wrote it in 569, so a long time before Dante even was born. The song, in its original form, is about the banners of the king coming forward. And these, these words signify a splinter of the holy cross that was being brought as a relic to Poitiers. And so they were celebrating the important event of having uh, this important relic in Poitiers. But now what Dante, actually through Virgil's words here, these are words by, spoken by Virgil, who can afford that uh, very literary trick of reversing the meaning of a song. He's like doing the counter song to Venantius Fortunatus. Virgil adds one little word at the end of that line saying, inferni. Vexilla regis prodiunt inferni, or the banners of the king of hell are coming forward. He's announcing precisely the epiphany, the manifestation, the apparition of Satan himself, which would look pretty much like the image, the mosaic we saw at the beginning. But the irony of it all is that in this very uh, musical song, and I'm saying musical because it's, it was always performed, it was born as a song, it was always uh, performed. As you can see here, for example, there's um, an 11th century manuscript from the British Library that has these little signs over the lyrics. Those are called nooms, and those are um, um, an old, very, very old, early medieval type of notation uh, that is not like our, our five staff uh, um, or five line staff. It's a little more elementary, but those little things are notes. So it goes way back, it's always been performed, and now Virgil strips it of its music because he's just reciting the line, the opening line, 
saying that the banners of the king of hell are coming forward. And it's ironic, because when we get to, when we get to actually see Satan in Dante's Inferno, we may have mixed reactions. A lot of my students, when I have them read the 34th canto of Inferno, go like, eh, yeah, it's all interesting, but this guy is not scary enough. Lucifer is not scary enough. And he, in a way, he is not. Tell you what, actually, um, John Frecero uh, was a great professor at uh, NYU, wrote a beautiful article about this. Because if you think of Milton's Satan, uh, that is a larger than life figure. Dante's Satan is just a loser. He is stuck in the middle of a frozen swamp. He cannot move. All he can do is flap his three sets of wings, because remember, he's a, he's a, he's a fallen angel. So he has three sets of wings. He has three faces and three sets of eyes, and he's weeping from all of them as he chews on three different sinners, Brutus, Cassius, and, of course, Judas. He is more disgusting than frightful. Um, and the point there, and the irony, is that he's not moving. He's not coming forward. He couldn't move if he wanted. He has no power, no physical uh, mobility, and no willpower left. He's like a machine, actually. Dante uses the word edificio. He is like an edifice. He's a thing. It's interesting, right? Because by reciting Venantius Fortunatus's words, Virgil is actually mocking Satan himself. And without even the beauty of the music, it's just using the words. The tune changes in purgatory, as we can imagine. And here's a beautiful image by Gustave Doré, who was one of the first, um, one of the most important uh, uh, illuminators or engravers of Dante's Divine Comedy. The, one of the first lines that Dante offers us in the second canticle, the canticle of rebirth, is that dead poetry will resurrect. La morta poesi resurga. And it does indeed, it does indeed in the next canto when Dante and Virgil are just uh, catching their breath, I guess, after the long journey in hell. And they are on the shore of a beautiful island with a huge mountain that they are supposed to climb now. So uh, obviously, the big work is still ahead. And they, uh, they spot in the distance a little skiff, a little boat with a lot of souls on it. They are the recently dead who are going to go to purgatory. And as you know, purgatory is a place where the souls have to purge themselves from the sins that they have, uh, have committed in life. And how do they do that? They do that in Dante's purgatory. Uh, by undergoing physical punishment, now you may object, physical how, since they're dead and they don't have a body anymore. Well, that explains that. Um, that there's a beautiful lesson about embryology and the formation of an aerial body in Canto 25 of Purgatory. Just to keep the, so the story short, uh, what happens is that once the body dies, the soul is sent to Purgatory, and the new body made of thin air is formed by uh, you know, virtue of uh, uh, miraculous virtue. And that uh, fake body serves to perceive the pain. Hmm? until, of course, doomsday, when all the souls will take back their bodies, their physical bodies in flesh. Now here, as I said, the tune changes. Why does it change? Because there is no more, no more desperation and no more ugly sounds or scream. However, it's still not fun and game. Uh, these souls sing a song that's called Tonus Peregrino, or uh, Peregrino means pilgrim because it, it's a melodic line that goes up and down. And it goes, In exitu Israel de Egipto cantavan tutti insieme ad una voce, con quanto di quel salmo e poscia scripto. Now, these three lines contain an enormous amount of information for us. First of all, we do have a recording of that. And if we wanted, you could uh, listen to perhaps a few notes. But uh, 
we can go back to this. I have more stuff to have you listen to that's, uh, that's more meaningful yet. What I want to point at here is, first of all, the quotation, in exitu Israel de Egipto, of course, these souls are, in a way, compared to the Israelites coming out of their captivity. They are now free from the captivity of the physical life, but they still have to do quite a lot of work before they can ascend to paradise. Cantavan tutti insieme ad una voce. They all sang in one voice. In one voice, that is a very specific musical uh, piece of musical information. It means that they sing unisonally. It's a choir that struggles to, to learn how to sing together with no uh, ornamentations or no polyphonic additions to it. Now, you should know that uh, Gregorian chant, which was big uh, at this time, was big for the entire Middle Ages, and it still is. Gregorian chant is a very uh, specific repertory of plain chant, unisonal songs, and theologians and priests, including the Pope of Dante, one of the popes of Dante's time, were particularly um, were particularly thorough and attentive that these songs be performed in the correct way. In 1322, one year after Dante's death, Pope John XXII complained in a papal ball that the new, the new uh, musicians and the new clerics who could sing invented new ornamentations and they would uh, sing polyphonically. So Paris was the, one of the greatest uh, polyphonic centers in Europe, but Italy too had its own um, development in its own school. What I'm trying to say is that in purgatory, in Dante's purgatory, we have plain chant, monophony. So all the souls sing the same melody at the, t at the same time, and that's not easy. I have to learn how to do that. Polyphony is something that we will encounter in Dante's paradise later. I'm going to skip. <laughs> well, there you go. So. It's pretty soothing, too. It's beautiful. Um, but the whole of purgatory does not present always this uh, soothing tone. Now, those souls disembark and are just starting their purification process. In other layers of the mountain, because this mountain has ledges that they have to climb upon. We can, for example, we can uh, hear a pain in the voices of these other sinners here. These are the gluttons, those who overate and overdrank. And Dante describes their song as something quite painful. Ed ecco piangere e cantar su die labia mea domine per modo tal che diletto e doglia parturie. So their song, labia mea domine, which is a song, of course, my lips, my lord, open so they can sing unto you. This is what the original psalm says. Dante only needs to quote the first few words because everybody would have this song in their in their minds. They would uh, know it, right? Even before. Uh, in Exit to Israel, Dante specifies that they sing the entire song. Con quanto di quel salmo e poscia scritto, with the rest of the song. So he's very specific. They sang the entire song back then. They are singing this now, and they are singing it in such a way that brings at once delight and grief. How does it bring delight and grief? Well, it does, because these souls are undergoing pretty harsh punishments. In the particular case of the gluttons, their punishment is to starve. They starve until they become so thin and gaunt that they, uh, they desire some of the fruits that they can see up the tree there, but they are not allowed to eat them. So they are sort of learning how to temper their physical urges to over, overindulge. But the whole game of music and words is pretty subtle here. First of all, labia mea, my lips. 
they have to relearn how to use those lips. They use them in the wrong way, by eating too much and drinking too much. Um, now they have to use them properly to sing. And this is what they sing. Uh, beautiful hymn that is, however, being pushed through their mouths through um, a, a painful expression, delight and grief. And that oxymoron is at the base of Dante's purgatory, the notion that these souls can get to heaven, essentially, by undergoing physical punishment is the nature, is the origin of the oxymoron. So they have to suffer yet a little bit more uh, in order to purify and cleanse their sins. And so that's why there's both delight and grief in their, their words. Here is another beautiful song. Now these guys in Canto 16 of Purgatory are the wrathful, and they are forced to sing, well, forced. They choose, of course, by their own accord, to sing the psalm, Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God, which is perfectly fitting, right, for the type of sin that they committed. <laughs> As you can hear, it is once again a unisonal performance. Well, this is of course something that I found on uh, um, on YouTube, and it's the Pontificio Istituto of Sacred Music, so um, in Milan. And uh, the repertory that Dante hints at here is precisely the uh, Gregorian chant, the Gregorian repertory. So there is a sort of musical training that trains their souls, their spirits, before they can. Uh, go on and sing polyphonically in uh, heaven. Now, on the properties of music for the soul, for the healing of the soul, Thomas Aquinas had a few words to spend. He said that uh, the use of music in the divine praises is a salutary institution, and um, praising God with our lips is necessary for our own sake as we pray. The human soul is moved in various ways according to various melodies of sound. So music is a powerful tool. Pick your favorite songs wisely because they have an effect on your soul. Um, and also pick the moments of your lives when you listen to them. The uh, mode of fruition is very important too. If you want to listen to the words, if you want to just be carried away by the music or just jump on the rhythm, it's all fine. Just make sure that you don't do that in the wrong uh, context. Augustine. Augustine also had a few important notions about music. Uh, Augustine is one of the conundrums when it comes to Dante's Divine Comedy because he is indeed mentioned in Paradise, in Cantos 10 to 14. He's mentioned once and he's there for four cantos in a row. But he doesn't receive the great attention that Thomas Aquinas receives, for example. However, a lot of his uh, theology is, seems to be at the basis of Dante's thought as well. Here, for example, is how, how Augustine describes how he wept in the hymns and canticles of the church, how deeply he was moved by the voices of uh, um, thy sweet speaking church. The voices flowed into my ears and the truth was poured forth into my heart where the tide of my devotion overflowed and my tears ran down. So think of this again. Would you say that, he, that Augustine was happy or unhappy when he was singing and weeping like that? What would you say? Happy or unhappy? Happy, happy indeed. And yet he cries, right? It's the same type of situation that we have in some of Dante's scenes, with weeping and grief and delight at the same time. And there's more about Augustine, of course. Uh, I, really, I really like the ways that Dante seems to follow some of his ideas. Um, there are, uh, so Augustine is a, uh, an advocate of moderation and composure. He wants the songs to be appropriate to the situation. He doesn't want songs to be uh, sung at the top of one's lungs or to be um, overly 
uh, excessively joyous or excessively demure. So he wants a mode of performance, as we, as we said before. And that is very important to him. Otherwise, we risk to end up in, uh, in sinning. Here he says that the difference between a good or a bad song is not in the intervals, but in the performance, in ipso sono. So that's why I think that Dante had this in mind, lest um, we sin weakly when we sing things in the wrong way, in, a, in, in an inappropriate context uh, or way. Now, I want to offer to you a few more examples of music. This one is a beautiful hymn, Salve Regina, that Dante actually has some of the souls of the uh, rulers, that is the kings and princes of his time, sing in Purgatorio Canto Seven. Salve Regina, it's a beautiful song that they sing to I don't want to dwell too long because um, time is eternal in heaven and not here. But I, want, I do want to bring your attention to the beautiful music and the manuscript here. What we have in front of us is an example of a Gregorian chant. So you can see that the melody is on one staff of music, right? And we have lyrics written below. So this is a more, it's a later form of notation than the nooms before. But look at this other one. I actually meant to switch here. Uh, this is a beautiful polyphonic, four voice polyphonic motet from the mid 13th century. So it's way before Dante's time. Um, amazingly enough, Parisian polyphony at Notre Dame de Paris uh, around 1250 flourished and, uh, and produced some of the most most touching, I would say, also most complex pieces of music. Now, the one that I'm going to have you listen to is from a book called Magnus Liber Organi, or the Great Book of Organ, where organ is another word for polyphony. And it's so-called art polyphony. It's all written down. So what you will have here is that the lowest, you see it's four parts. Hmm? The lowest staff has the Gregorian uh, melody, but it's so slowed down. It's amazing because we, we do these things today with a computer. They did it in their minds. The Gregorian tune is slowed down in order to allow to the um, voices, uh, the voices, the organal voices, the counterpoints, to go up and down over it. Now, Viderunt omnes. If you're wondering, we're still on the first syllable, and it goes on for quite a while. It's 11 minutes long. So I'll push pause, because we can listen to the whole thing. But you can, you can understand why the Pope, John the Twenty Second in 1322, had to write a papal ball to say, and these are his words, you know, the new disciples sing new notes and new ornamentations, and these new musics do not heal. He says, non medentur, they do not heal anymore. These songs are supposed to have a medical, spiritually medical function. And that's precisely my point. Music in purgatory has a medical function. It's like a pharmacon, a, a pill for your soul. You know, there's actually a story. In the 1960s, there was this uh, monastery in southern France. At some point, the new abbot, a new abbot came in, young with a lot of uh, new vision, and he had, he decided to reduce 
the amount of hours that the monks would sing every day from eight to only one. A lot of these older monks, in the turn of a few weeks, developed depression. And then um, a French-Italian doctor was called to cure the depression, to treat them, and he found, his name was Tomati, Tomatis, he found that they needed to sing again. And he had them start over a singing cycle again, and they all got better. So there actually is, and there is a, a Tomatis method for the cure of depression. Look it up on the internet. There are uh, articles on quite interesting journals. Um, usually they expose you to music, uh, Mozart or Gregorian chant, precisely, in order to uplift your, your uh, inner feelings. So what we're saying here today, and what Dante was doing in his day, and the monks in his day, is not some fantasy or some romanticization of music. It's real. It's real. Music does have an effect on us. And polyphony, as I said, is something that only happens in paradise. Or here again, uh, because this is a beautiful place, of course. <laughs> um, I want to say something before I wrap up, because I think we are approaching uh, our time limit. Um, a few more minutes, great. Uh, because I am going to argue, as I have in my book and other uh, places, that Dante does represent polyphony in paradise, and that he does represent this complex four voice, or at least three voice form of polyphony. How do we, how can we say if we can indeed say that Dante was exposed to polyphony during his life. And did he ever even hear about it or listen to it? So no smoking gun here. The question, the, the matter is quite delicate. Because the point is that even though uh, it was 1250 when that big book of organ was produced in Paris, that big book of organ made it into Florence only in the 1400s, or at least. That's what we know for sure. It might have been there for a longer time. There is little evidence or no, evi no notated manuscripts. Let me put it this way. In Italy, from Dante's day, there are no notated manuscripts like the four staff music that I just showed. So there is no evidence that complex polyphony that needed to be written was performed regularly in Italian cities. However, number one, we do have the ordinal book of Dante's Day Florence Cathedral, Santa Reparata. The ordinal book is like the script of the liturgy, and it contains a few expressions, a few sentences that say, uh, on days such as um, Good Friday, or when there's uh, um, one of the canons who died, and there's like a, a funeral occasion, it is forbidden to sing polyphonically because polyphony is supposed to augment the joy and the solemnity of a song. So wait a minute. If they forbid something on specific occasions, what does that tell you? That they would do that regularly on all other occasions. So organum, organ or polyphony, was indeed performed regularly during Dante's day at the cathedral. Now it remains to be seen which kind of polyphony. Likely the two-voice, simple, improvised type of polyphony. Otherwise, we would have the texts. And we don't have the texts. So there's polyphony that can be improvised as in a Simon Garfunkel. Pardon me. Uh, I love them. Um, Garfunkel would sing the second voice, right? They did not need to write that down. Because anyone who is musically trained, and there actually were uh, handbooks for improvising clauses uh, on certain portions of the song. Um, however, however, number two, there's an inventory from 1311 uh, of the library of Boniface VIII. Does anybody here know who Boniface VIII was? If you read the Divine Comedy or know anything about Dante, even if you just play the video game, I'm pretty sure that his name will pop up. It was the arch enemy of our poet. It was a pope who, uh, at some point, because he wanted to get Dante out of Florence, Dante was also a politician and a, and a, and a smart one, so. Boniface invites Dante at his court and keeps him close for four months, just the time to send his French troops over the city and see his power. Um, so Dante was a forced guest in Rome at uh, the court of Boniface VIII. And guess what we find listed 
listed, listed in, uh, in Boniface VIII's inventory. We do not have the actual books, unfortunately, but we find this. It's only in Latin, so good luck reading it. But I'm telling you, these are descriptions of four books about uh, French polyphony, French motets, mm -hmm. very uh, close. They could actually be the very same repertory as the Magnus Liber organ. And this belonged to Boniface VIII. We also know from, um, um, from um, some of the information, I don't know if I copied it here. Anyway, we know that they were um, bound with wooden covers. And you would say, well, sure, who cares? Well, we do care. Why would you bind, why would you bind a book that is a gift to a pope? in wooden cover rather than leather, which looks much, much nicer. Because wooden is more resistant. Why do you need a book to be resistant? Because it needs to be used. So there is a high chance that those books that were in Boniface VIII's uh, collection were indeed used for performance. High chance, not certain. And just number three, to give you also this, Marquetus of Padua was active in 1307, as early as 1307 in Padua, northeast of Italy, um, was one of uh, the Italian's Ars Nova greatest musicians and uh, theorists. Now, Dante lived in Verona. How many miles are there, like 40? I don't even know. So it would, I, I would think that it would be almost impossible that Dante would be completely deaf to all the musical novelties that are being developed 40 miles away from, you, from his home. And so we know for sure that there was at least a two-voice polyphony in Florence, and Dante knew it because he would go to church. And I find it very likely that he would know more than just that. Um, we have a few quotes in the paradise, from the paradise that, I can, uh, that we can look at. For example, this one. This one is beautiful. Um, Dante here meets um, uh, um, uh, Charles Martel, one of the um, uh, kings of the Anjou dynasty that he did like. Um, and he describes the music surrounding his appearance as a two-voice polyphony. It's, uh, um, it's a beautiful example of organum melismaticum. He says, E come in fiamma, favilla si vede, e come in voce, voce si discerne quando una è ferma, e l'altra va e riede. So one of the voices Right? singing this Hosanna song. One of the voices goes up and down, the other one holds, like tenor. Tenere in Italian means to hold, because the tenor, the tenor holds the note. So this is something that, that finds very specific uh, examples in the repertory of the time. And this is the two-voice polyphony, highly probable uh, to be something that was um, sung even in Florence. Um, one of the most beautiful sections of Dante's Paradise is the cantos 10 to 14. That's where Dante meets the theologians. That's where Augustine is. That's where Thomas Aquinas and Saint Bonaventure are. Thomas Aquinas, Dominican, Bonaventure, Franciscan. Guess what they do? They start singing the praises of each other's uh, patron saint. So Aquinas sings the praises of St. Francis, and Bonaventure sings the praises of St. Dominic. Why did Dante want to stage this uh, homage, reciprocal homage, between the two orders that were so important in the 1300s? Because they were not that peaceful on earth. There were a lot of theological disputes, a lot of political frictions, and sometimes uh, differences. And uh, Dante here, instead, in envisions a match made in heaven. And he has them sing together and dance together. This is something powerful. He has two crowns of, uh, <clears throat> two crowns of uh, 12 spirits each. So it's 24 wise men from the church. Women weren't even allowed to sing in churches back then. Um, perform, and they perform about the Trinity. Dante says, Lì si cantò non bacco non peana, ma tre persone, so three persons, the Trinity, hmm? in divina natura. And this is 
quite meaningful. They're singing about the Trinity, and they form this line. Now, this is, again, Doré's uh, engraving. It's, it's a beautiful image, quite accurately uh, close to Dante's description. You know what I haven't been able to prove? However, the Ternary Temple, I think I have a few quotes here. There are theorists from Dante's day, like Philippe de Vitry or Franco of Cologne and Marquetus of Padua, who theorized the perfection of the number three in music. So the perfect note would be the longa. It's a ternary tempo. So ternary tempo is the perfection in music. And how was the ternary tempo represented, or perfection, represented in terms of a musical, like the tempo signature? Do you know how that was represented in the, actually a few decades after Dante's died, damn it? as a circle with a dot at the center, which is precisely the image that Dante uh, portrays of himself standing in the middle of this singing and dancing crowd. So I find it fascinating. I still couldn't prove that Dante might have been exposed to that tempo signature. But nonetheless, the Trinity is um, obviously the perfection that these souls are embodying in dance and song here. I also want to just say a couple of words about this quote from Canto 10, which is beautiful, because it compares the dance of these 24 uh, theologians to a Swiss clock, to a perfectly uh, timed clock with all these cogs. Indi come un, oro, come un orologio che ne chiami nell'ora che la sposa di Dio surge a mattinar lo sposo perché l'ami che l'una parte tira e l'altra urge tintin sonando con si dolce nota che lo ben disposto spirito d'amor turge così vi dio la gloriosa rota a muoversi e render voce a voce in tempra e in dolcezza che esser non può nota se non colà dove gioir si insembra. What he is saying is that this is a melange, tempra, tempra. It's a, a mix of sounds, a mix of different sounds. Boethius had described um, whatever harmony he might have known in his uh, s as, you know, sixth century, um, so a very elementary one. Maybe by harmony just meant uh, fifth or octave. Even Augustine speaks of the uh, well-sounding intervals of fifth and octave. Uh, but no more than that. Boethius describes, however, harmony in, as the uh, you know, uh, different sounds being uh, recomposed in one unity. So you can see how that is theologically quite profitable for Dante, who has a vision of the universe as a sounding machine, as a set of different cogs, all working in this perfect mechanism whose director is, director is God, and God even gets to play the lyre in Canto 15. La destra del cielo, God's right hand, plays the lyre at some point. I'm going to uh, conclude with just um, the last example of par paradisiac polyphony that Dante offers in Canto 28. First of all, why is it Canto 28? There are 33 cantos, once again, the ternary structure of the poem and the terza, no, the terza rima come to mind because they are a reflection of the Trinity and therefore perfection. William Mart, who is a, an, a very uh, famous musicologist at Stanford, argues that perhaps once Dante moves away or he soars so far high that he exceeds the boundaries of time and space, music has no place anymore. Music is based in time. And so once Dante is, travels to the Empyrean, which is the uh, infinite universe, outside the known geography, astronomical geography, uh, then time becomes eternal, and you cannot make, time, make music without time. So that might be, perhaps, the reason that Dante doesn't mention music after Paradiso 28. But here in Paradiso 28, he offers us this beautiful last vision and auditory feeling, which is about the choirs of the angels eternally singing 
uh, in three different melodies. L'altro ternaro perpetualmente Osanna sberna con tre melode che suonano in tre ordini di Letizia Ondes interna. Tre melode, so three melodic lines, three different melodies, but eternally played. That is indeed polyphony and couldn't be anything else if you listen to me. I thank you for your attention and I'm going to stop here. <laughs>